So our special guest today is Matt Shaw. Welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in writing? Um, do you want a serious answer? Uh, any answer you want to give me? Okay, we'll, we'll do serious. Uh, I started because uh, I was neglected as a child. Um my mum and dad basically were working all the time and my dad got sick so i wasn't allowed any friends around the house uh so i ended up just grabbing their typewriter and i started writing my first novel when i was 12 years old um it was crap but since then i've written loads of loads of books and people mostly know me for extreme horror although i actually write more supernatural and psychological they just don't sell as well yeah, you, you do children's as well, don't you? Uh, yeah, but obviously not under the same name because that might traumatise some children. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I I would like to point out I don't mind traumatising children because I, I really don't like kids. Um, I just love their imaginations. I, I think they've got wonderful imaginations and we as adults, we kind of squash their imaginations too much. Um, making them into like mini me's or part of the system and I think it's fun to play with their imaginations it is yeah I mean their imaginations are fantastic because some of the things they come up with um, especially my lot some of the things they come up with is uh, brilliant absolutely amazing yeah but when you're at school it's kind of beaten out of you or at least it was with me but they tried um you know if you had a, a a thought that was outside of the box they would tell you you were wrong so they yeah. wouldn't um celebrate the fact that you're free thinking and you're showing initiative and things like that they would just say no that's not how we do it yeah that's right i homeschool mine now um so they don't get that here they're is that like, legal? You what, sorry? Is that legal? Yeah, it is. I always thought in this country it wasn't legal. Yeah, apparently there's no actual legal um, right to send them to school. You you can actually take them out if you want to. That's your legal right. So. Nice. I would, um, if I had kids, I would send them to school, though, because I just don't want to be around them. <laughs> I'll be like, no, no, you can go to school today. You're stressing me out. <laughs> I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> How old are they? Um, the youngest is 10, and then we've got a 15. No, sorry, she's just turned 16. Oh, so the 10-year-old has just come out of their I'm a little shit age, and they're soon to be going back into it. And the eldest, I'm presuming, is starting to become a bit of a handful. Yeah, but the uh, ten-year-old's still in that, still in that. Oh, I'm a little shit age, so uh, I don't yeah. think she's ever going to come out of that. <laughs> don't worry. When they're eighteen, you can kick them both out. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Is that how it works? Because I've got a twenty-year-old, uh, a twenty-three-year-old, and a twenty-six-year-old at home still. <laughs> uh, well, are they paying rent? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Oh, look, you were just doing it all wrong, aren't you? Yeah. The youngest can go and work for Nike, making trainers in a sweatshop. <laughs> the 15-year-old you can just put out on the streets so they can learn life the hard way. And the other ones, they have to pay you rent. That's that's the rules. <laughs> yeah, I must have missed that memo. But no, This is probably why I'm not a parent. <laughs> <laughs> so what drew you to the horror genre? Money. Really? <laughs> um, well, I've always had a dark imagination, but um, I've got more of a wacky sense of humour, although it recently got me in a fair amount of trouble. Um, and I like I like writing horror, but I, I started writing extreme horror purely by chance because there was a publishing company um, who was publishing one of my horror books that I co-wrote with Michael Bray. And he said, if you excuse me a minute, I'm just going to go read a bit more of you sick bastards. And I thought, sick bastards, I quite like that as a title. And just to upset that publisher, I wrote 10 pages of a really graphic horror book and I sent it back to him just for a laugh. Um, no, you might be good friends. And um, I thought, actually, I quite like this story. It's really twisted. 
So I thought I'll finish it and then I'll just release it. And I know I'll get loads of one star reviews, but I don't care. I'm doing it for me. And that book was called Sick Bastards and it ended up going straight to number one. You know, a big film company bought the film rights and I quit work on the strength of that book. Um, and that was what over a decade ago. So now, like I said, I've been tarred with the extreme horror brush. Um, but yeah, I don't just do the horrors. Yeah. So um, walk us through your process of developing a story idea. Where do your ideas come from? Uh, I've always had bad dreams. So whenever I do the the writing lessons that I teach, I always say you, you have to keep a notebook by your bed, you know, because if you wake up from a bad dream, write it down real fast. Don't try and remember it for the morning because you will have forgotten it by then. But also um, I do a lot of drugs and that helps. And I know that doesn't sound brilliant on paper, but they are um, prescribed drugs. Um, <laughs> So it's not just mats on another bender. Um, but I get a lot of pain and things. So the hospital prescribes me morphine. Yeah. Um, so that if I take that for like three, four days in a row, if I'm having a really bad time of it, um, which, by the way, is rare because I don't want to be on any drugs. Um it really makes me hallucinate quite badly. And the dreams are really vivid and horrible. Um, I say horrible. But it's horrible in a great way. I, you know, I'm always fascinated with it. Yeah. Um, but the best time was last year. I was in hospital three separate occasions, and they were pumping me full of the good stuff. And I saw so many ghosts in that hospital. Um, but I actually ended up writing a supernatural book called The Immortal Shadows about the ghosts which are trapped in hospitals. Yeah. You know, the souls that refuse to believe that they're dead, so they just keep walking the horror uh, the, the corridors. Um, so, yeah, really bad dreams and drugs. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's a good way of doing it. <laughs> I don't like planning things, though. I know some authors, you know, they like to have their books fully mapped out. Yeah. Um, but I don't like that. I believe it kind of pigeonholes you. You know, it forces you into an area where the book might not have naturally gone had you just been writing it on the fly. So you're a pantser. Yeah, pretty much. Um, at the end of like, if I do it like today, I'm doing a big writing session. So by the end of it, I will finish what I'm doing by writing loads of different ideas for where the book's going to go next. So when I'm next sitting down, I'm not sitting down to just nothing. I've got rough ideas and then I'll just start writing and let it carry on itself. Yeah. So how do you create your characters? I just think of all the people in life that are just horrible people and I just kind of base it on them. Um, you know, I, I deal with, um, I wrote a book called Hub, which is not available on Amazon because of the graphic content. Um, it's kind of highlighting paedophilia and things like that. Yeah. And the lead in that was based on um, a man named Harold, uh, who, who, by the way, in real life, he's a, he, well, he was. He was a really nice guy. He was my primary school teacher and he taught me manners. So if someone asks a question, do you want such and such? If I would reply to him with OK, he actually hit me. Um, he would use a ruler to smack me across the hands because it's rude to answer a question with OK. Um, so, you know. He taught a lot of manners for me and how I should behave in public. And then years later, when I left school, knowing in mind, he also took me on holiday and, and, and bathed me with his grandchild, who was in the same class as me, never touched us. Um, but years later, when I left school, he was actually arrested and charged with being a paedophile. Wow. And it's scary to think how influential this guy had been in my life um to then find out actually he's a monster um so I, I i take people like that so the ones who have successfully put masks on in reality and then i like to peel the mask off them while i'm writing the book yeah you mentioned hub um now was that the one that was that caused some controversy because it had an ai cover yeah, um, a few of my books have got AI, AI covers and people uh, proper kicked off a stink about it. 
and they say I don't support artists and it really pisses me off because these people they don't know what they're talking about for the most part the people that are actually complaining are people that don't support my work have never supported my work won't support my work and are normally graphic artists themselves yeah. but the books that have AI covers they're actually re-releases in pocketbook format of books that have been published long ago but I don't have the original covers which I paid for through graphic artists to put on the new books yeah so these books are available on my store but I've already bought covers for these books that are available on Amazon yeah then I went on Patreon and I asked you know would you rather I charged you guys a little bit more for these pocket books and paid a graphic artist to do the covers or are you happy with ai covers for these particular ones not one person said they wanted to pay more to support a graphic artist yeah they said they don't care about the cover yeah so what's your stance on ai yeah um i think it has its uses uh and you know People say, well, what about when AI starts writing books? I don't care. You know, there's a place for both mediums. Um, I think AI is useful in that it can inspire graphic artists. Uh, I've certainly seen a lot of graphic artists selling covers which started as AI covers, but then they adapted to make it more of their own. Yeah. Know that they're using it as a tool to help and boost their own work as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I don't really care about it um, to the point of I don't think it's going to destroy graphic artists and I don't think it's going to destroy authors. Um, personally, I would never use it to write a book because for me, writing a book is the enjoyment comes from the writing process yeah so if you just program a bot to, to write your book where's the enjoyment in that i don't get it um and with regards to covers you know hub had a ai cover because i was never actually releasing it to the mainstream um i was never putting it on amazon it was only ever available through my store. So I thought, well, I'm not going to make any money on this book. Since then, the book has done me very well. And I have commissioned a graphic artist to do a special edition of the three books combined. So because the book's done well, I can now afford to go and give graphic artists work. Yeah. So it's, like I say, it's a tool. Um, I don't think it would ever replace 100% what, what people can do. But yeah. I also... It's very narrow minded for people to say that anyone that uses graphic, uh, anyone, that is, anyone that uses AI is an arsehole, effectively. Yeah, it's, just, it's a big debate at the moment, isn't it? Especially in the writing world where they um, they are sort of like up in the air about people using AI for writing. But as you say, it takes the fun out of writing if you're using AI. Yeah, I don't see the point in doing it for, for the actual writing thing. I understand for the covers, and I understand why graphic artists are upset about it. Let's just, you know, put that out there as well. Um, you know, they say that there's some platforms that have actively stolen work, and you can see signatures on the work of where it's been stolen from. Um, personally, I haven't actually seen that side of things, but I believe that is a big part of a uh, big part of the problem that they are discussing. Um I just try and stay in my own lane. I, I get enough drama thrown my way without all of that. But like I say, when I see the people moaning about the AI covers um, and me, like like one person on Books of Horror, he said, you know, even without all the drama surrounding Matt Shaw, I was still going to try his work. But then I realized he uses AI covers and I will never use someone that doesn't support graphic artists and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I, I went back to him and said, actually – in the decade I've been doing this, I have receipts that total just shy of £20,000, which have gone to graphic artists. So you can't say I don't support graphic artists. Yeah. And again, as I just explained to you, the books that have the AI covers are re-releases of books that already have proper, uh, proper covers by people that have designed them for me and who have charged me for them. Um, 
had I still had the original covers that I could have just resized onto the pocketbook, I just would have used that. And then there would never be any complaints. But Yeah, but they wouldn't be the same, though, would they? Because if you resize something, it, it always distorts the picture slightly, doesn't it? Yeah, and the, the resized books, they're mainly meant for my store. They're a, they're a cheaper way for people to get signed books from me because it's cheaper to produce them in pocketbook size. Um, so I brought the prices right down. So, you know, now you can get a signed book from me starting at £10. Whereas I go on other authors' websites and their signed books start at like $25. So about £20, give or take. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm trying to make my work more accessible to people and have it signed for them um and these people they've they've said they don't care about the covers you know the poll not one person said i'd rather you paid a graphic artist for these new these new book formats um you know if if that was the way that people wanted it then i would definitely increase the the book prices not by a lot you know, just enough to cover a graphic artist, um, because as it is with these books, when when I sell them, I'm lucky if I make like one pound fifty a copy. Yeah. So you know, knowing in mind this is my full time job, I'm I'm shifting a lot of books to stay to stay in business. So how many books have you got? Uh, there's over four hundred books now. Really. Yeah, but yeah, don't forget my books they're, they're mostly novellas, so they're mostly around 20,000 words because I have I have ADHD and I hate writing long books. Yeah. Because I um we'll take Stephen King as an example and I will just point out now that I am in no mean uh, no way attacking Stephen King as an author. <laughs> He's a very talented son of a bitch. Um but his work isn't to my tastes because it's so padded with information. You know, he really builds the whole universe for the worlds he's creating. Um, but for me personally, I don't have the patience for that. I like quick reads where I can take it on holiday with me and read it on the plane or read it by a beach or even read it on the toilet, you know. Yeah. Um, and that kind of writing style just doesn't really suit me either, you know, the longer fiction. Yeah. I mean, it, novellas, they're a big thing at the moment, aren't they? There are a lot of novellas out there, more so than novels that I see coming out. I think I think the world is changing, um, as well as becoming a far crueler place. I think people just don't have time anymore. Um, you know, they don't have time to sit there and read a massive tomb of a book. I just got a book uh, given to me. And so I'm just grabbing it now um, for my birthday. I'm dying to read it. And then I realized it's 700 pages. And I was like, oh, that's not going to happen because I don't have the time to sit there and read it. You know, I'm self-employed. Yeah. So I need to keep working. If I don't, I worry that my audience will go elsewhere. Um, I just want to quickly loop back to the AI thing, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's okay. Um, well, one thing that I've noticed is uh, people complaining about the AI, you know, covers AI books, but no one seems to be mentioning AI films. So you have directors and camera crews and everything else, but more and more of the equipment is becoming controlled by computers. Um, you know, for example, I, I, I've got a film production company and on my iPad, I can control a camera, its movement, and the way it moves around a, a, a room. But no one seems to care about that. And that's taking work away from people that would otherwise do that job. Yeah, that's very true. So it just seems that, People are just picking and choosing what they want to agree with and disagree with. And that's I, I think that's what frustrates me the most. Yeah. So you mentioned your film, your film um, production. Um, what do you do? Uh, well, we uh, we uh, what back in 2018, we made a feature film called Monster, which was based on my book that I co-wrote with Michael Bray again. Um, and since then, we've been making films. So I think we've got six features out now, over 20 short films. We've started, well, I say started for the last three years, we've been doing a film festival off the back of it. Um, and that company is now launching a publishing company as well for books uh, my own books aren't going to be published through there because 
a lot of the time my name is kind of tarred with mud and things. Yeah. So um, I just thought, you know what, let's leave my name out of it and let the other authors have their books out there, um, you know, with rates that are fairer than what other publication companies are doing for them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just just keep keep building the, uh, the businesses up. So when's your publishing coming out, the publishing company? Uh, it's already started. We've got our first book coming out, uh, I think it's next week. Um, and then we have three other authors that have submitted their work for us to read. Um, there's a team of us that actually read it, because, again, it's not just me that that does everything for that side of things. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I won't even be involved in the slightest. Um but I think the, the next book after this person's um, next week or the week after, it won't be be until the new year because we're not going to rush books out. I said it'll be best just to have two to three quality titles a year um, from different people. Fantastic. So going back to your writing, have you? I know you said you've done a couple that have been by your own experience, especially the hospital hospital one. But do you normally base characters or plots that are inspired by your own experiences or fears? Yeah, I mean, I I absolutely hate spiders, so I thought I want to write a spider story to try and help cure my phobia of them. Um, it didn't work; it made it worse because <laughs> it was just. I thought I'm not scared of like I dislike big spiders, you know, like tarantula type stuff. Um, if it's in my house, it's going to have to die. Those are the rules. If it's outside, you will just see me very, very far away from where that particular spider is because it's in its natural habitat. I have no business going near it. Um, but inside the house, yeah, I don't like them. But this particular story, I did little spiders, uh, the ones that. They just sneak up on you like ninjas. Yeah. And when it bites you, all of your blood cells turn into mini spiders, you know, little hatchlings. And then they then come crawling out of all of your orifices. So out of your nose, past your eyeballs, out of your mouth, your ears. And when I was writing it, a little spider ran across my hand <laughs> and I absolutely shit my pants. <laughs> um Needless to say, that that poor little spider did not survive. Um, you know, reflex killed him. Uh, but yeah, so if if I've got things that I'm unsure about or I'm scared about or just even slightly apprehensive about, I will turn it into a book um, just because I think it's therapeutic. So what's the hardest part of writing a book in the horror genre particularly? Um... <laughs> I would say trying to keep original stories going is the hardest part because so many people are writing now that it's impossible to stay on top of who's done what. And you just know there's going to be um, crossovers at some point where, oh, well, such and such did a book about spiders that, that turn your blood cells into spiders kind of thing. I, th I think that's always a danger of of this particular genre is with so many people coming out the woodwork to write their own horror novels, we're going to see a lot more duplicates as it were. Yeah. So what's been the most difficult scene you've ever had to write? Hmm. I'll be honest with you. I don't know that one. Um, I know I should say hub because of what it dealt with. But weirdly, I really enjoyed writing that book because it just it just wrote itself. Yeah. Um, you know, so some books they they fight you right from the start, and you're like, why am I even bothering with this? I think for me, one of the hardest ones was probably in How Much To, where the man's pet dog was chained in a room. And to get out of the room, the man had to get the key out of his dog's stomach um, within a certain time frame. And the only way he could do that is literally by digging into the stomach with his bare hands. Yeah. Because um, I'm not really a people fan because every day there's reasons that people disappoint you. But animals, I, I, I yeah, I don't like the idea of hurting animals. Um but sometimes it's necessary for a story. 
that's one of the biggest things in uh, extreme horror, isn't it? With animals, you can do whatever you want to people, including babies and children and things like that, but you can't kill the dog. Yeah, um, and I don't agree with that. <laughs> uh, I think everything should be fair game within extreme horror, as long as it's not hate speech. Um, so if the story dictates that the dog must die, then the dog must die. However, what I do not like is I do not like people doing it just for shock value. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole point of this guy going in and the room uh, and the dog being there is because it's it needed to be the hardest thing possible for him to do to be able to get out of that room. So they picked on his dog because what sane person would ever want to cause their pet any harm whatsoever? Yeah. Um, you know, it, you, you just wouldn't do it. And if I was in that situation, I don't know how I would get back out of that room because... I don't think I could hurt my dog, even though she really annoys me sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I think as long as the story dictates it and it's not just for the shock value, people should write what they want and just not be afraid of it. I said it before, um, you know, you see people dictating what someone should and shouldn't write. And that's happened once before in history with with the Nazis and it didn't go brilliantly. And we shouldn't we shouldn't have that. <laughs> In this day and age, people should be able to write what they want so long as it's not, you know, hate speech. And readers should have the right to read what they want, but be pre-warned about the content. So if they wanted to avoid something, they don't accidentally stumble across it. Yeah. So you think there should be trigger warnings? I think there should be trigger warnings to some degree. Like sometimes uh, what I've seen is people go well overboard with them. You know, right from day one of my writing career, when the books properly took off, I put, you know, warning, this book contains extreme content. It's not for those light of heart. Because normally that's enough to put someone off who, you know, someone that loves, um, I don't know, Terry Pratchett, for example. They'll be like, oh, that's not my cup of tea. Move on. But then I've seen other people that literally list every single trigger warning at the start of their book. And I, I kind of think that's that's a spoiler alert, really, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose it can be um, in one respect. And I suppose there are readers out there that need all those trigger warnings. But a few book reviewers that I've done interviews with have said that they don't need all of those trigger warnings. So I think it's just like whatever the reader wants isn't it really yeah i think if the author wants to do it they can but it would be good if they put for a full list of trigger warnings please see the back of the book yeah and then a link there which would take the more sensitive of the readers um because let's be honest some of the readers are a lot more sensitive and that's absolutely fine they shouldn't be not permitted to read a genre that's interesting them just because they're a little bit more sensitive than other people maybe um, but by having the full list of trigger warnings at the back of the book, it would avoid spoilers. And most people who are used to the genre would just list, uh, would just move past that page anyway. Yeah, that's right. So I think that would be a win-win situation. Okay, so the next question. <laughs> Can oh. you share a memorable piece of feedback from a reader that made an impact on you? Uh, I think one of them um, was a one-star review, which basically just called me an arsehole. Um, and I think, I mean, that was quite close to the start of my career. It was after the Happy Ever After books. Yeah. And I realised that you're never going to be able to please everyone. And we should give up trying as authors. We should stick to writing what we want to write um, and then just go ahead and write it. People are always going to think, you know, hopefully not everyone, but people are always going to think that we're an arsehole. You know, we can't avoid that. You could be the nicest person on the planet and someone will still find a reason to hate you. And, you know, recently there's been a, a lot of, hoo-ha basically saying I attacked someone because they wrote a one-star review based on my work. 
um you know the people that are saying this clearly haven't looked at what actually happened because one star reviews i i think are are more important than the five star reviews five star reviews are really good for confidence boosting yeah because you're like hey look at that i'm great but the one star reviews when they're constructive they give us an opportunity to reflect upon our work and try and fix it but then when we loop back to the comment where you know one star Matt Shaw's an asshole, you then realize that while you're trying to fix things to make your work better there will always be that person out there that will hate you no matter what you try and do so don't adjust things too much you know if you're selling selling books and a majority of the reviews are good or average then keep going because your writing will improve by itself anyway so take the constructive criticism but then when you see the words of actual hate take that on board as well and keep it in mind that their opinion doesn't really matter in the great scheme of things other than to remind you that not everyone will like you yeah you've um you have come up across that quite a few times haven't you yeah, I, I get it quite a lot. I, I don't mind as much because, you know, the people like at the moment, there's um, this video is going around calling me misogynistic. Um, uh, I don't know. There's loads of videos going on around about me. <laughs> and I don't mind as much because it's from people that have never read my work or if they have, they certainly haven't talked about it. So they probably didn't like it or it wasn't good enough for them to remember, um, which is fine. But they don't really know me as a person. So they're attacking my character, whereas people that have actually met me, um, specifically in this scenario, the women that I've worked with with my films and things, because my films are quite graphic. They're, sometimes the women have been in, um, as, as one of my friends, Frankie, she put it, I was in a vulnerable position with you. And she was because she was in her underwear um, tied to a bed. Yeah. And yet she said, I wouldn't hesitate to work with you again because she knows that she's perfectly safe. So that kind of feedback means more to me than a whole load of videos from people that just don't really know me. Yeah. Um, or they want to listen to one side of a story and then decide that that's the truth of the matter, um, which, you know, happens a lot not just in my situation but you just got to look around um around twitter for example i mean you're based in england so you, you'll you'll understand russell brand for example yeah i'm not saying the guy's a nice person he's always been narcissistic but the amount of hate that has suddenly been poured on him for something that he was actively encouraged to be back in you know, early 2000s when times were different, as crazy as that sounds, it's just insane. And the amount of toxicity thrown his way from people that are just reading the press and deciding he's guilty before there's even a court case, that's the kind of world we live in now. All it takes is one person to throw some mud, it'll stick, then other people will come on and, and put more layers of mud on that. Back to my situation, I've seen it where this person's called me a misogynist. Uh, I saw another comment from a woman that I don't know saying that she's just worked with me, and I threatened to beat her up on set. And I'm like, I don't even know who this person is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't worked with any women that I don't actually know for over a year, but apparently this was a couple of months ago I was doing this. So it's just someone that's adding to the drama uh, for clicks and likes. Yeah, I mean, you're not alone, especially in the writing world. Um, there's authors out there that have had videos done saying that the book was so bad they're going to burn the book. Yeah, I think I think it was uh, one of them was uh, Chandler Morrison. Um, and it made me laugh because I think it's it, the book. Is it Dead Alive? Dead Inside? Something like that. Yeah. But people were actually burning his book. So he knows what it can be like to fall on the wrong side of the, the, uh, the audience that we're aiming for. Um, do you think it's sort of like... Um increases sales when 
it sort of goes viral like that on TikTok. It can do, yeah. I mean, I've had like I, I was like, oh my god, these people are, are straight up trying to cancel me, and a few authors stepped away from me. You know, Chandler being one of them, he actually unfollowed me on Twitter over all of the drama, and I thought, given all the drama that surrounded him during a uh, a convention he did, I thought that was kind of amusing, but each to their own. Good luck to him. Um, I've got no beef. The I, I I was for a bit worried. They're they're trying to cancel me. It's all going wrong. Um, you know these authors are stepping away from me. Um, but then I realised that they're authors that I've never actually really communicated with, and they're not really doing much themselves. But they're they're suddenly doing big status up, updates, uh, calling me a misogynist and uh, an incel and this and that. And I'm like. Why are they even saying anything? Um, but then I noticed that my sales were going up as a result. So the more people were attacking me on TikTok, and you know, I was getting death threats pretty much every day, along with just comments calling me all the bad names imaginable. Um, mm. But my sales are going up. And I've realized it's it's the Trump thing all over again. You know, when Donald Trump came into power, suddenly um, people with more extreme views on life got louder in their voices and they drowned out the quieter people. So when you were around that kind of environment, and I was because I used to work a lot in America with my books, you would suddenly hear a lot of hatred coming out but that doesn't mean that the quiet people are now thinking the same thoughts they're still there supporting who they want to support they're just not being as vocal about it yeah and i think that's something else that that was good for me to learn is that the internet really isn't as big as it thinks it is there are people out there who will be really loud on the internet they may well be loud in real life but there's a good proportion of people that don't even pay any attention to the to what happens online um and or they'll hear the drama and they won't care but they'll go and look into who's being talked about you know so Back to Russell Brand, you just see people commenting going hey I didn't know you before but I've subscribed to your channel now just because they hear the drama. So they go and investigate who it is and they make their own opinion. Whether that opinion is right or wrong remains to be seen. And that goes with all all cases. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think it's just really weird. But sales can definitely go up. I believe Chandler saw a, a little spike. Uh, Duncan Ralston, he got a lot of crap for writing Womb. Um and, you know, that book, I published it for him years ago, and it, it it did okay. But as soon as it went viral on TikTok, when sadly he had the rights, so I didn't get paid anymore, um, <laughs> you know, there were lots of people calling him out and saying he was a misogynist and this and that um, and attacking him. But his sales shot up. Aaron Beauregard, another one, look at Playground, that went on TikTok <laughs> He got hold over the call, uh, the coals for it, and his sales went up. Yeah, it's, uh, I've seen the playground one. Um, yeah, it's it's horrible what people say when they don't know the person. I find it quite funny though, because like myself, Aaron, Duncan, we're all incels apparently, and yet we're all married. So I'm like, okay, how does that work then? Um, you know, I would introduce you to my wife now, but she's still locked up in the basement where I keep her. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, so these people, they're just hateful for the spot, uh, for the for the sake of it, really. And I don't understand why. Like, I get that you dislike a book. That's absolutely fine. But at what stage in our life did we suddenly realise that making a video attacking the person behind the book is better than just putting the book down and moving on to something that we actually enjoy. I think it's the day and the age of TikTok. Yeah, well, it's not just TikTok, is it? It's X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's just become, say, the, the world seems to be getting more hateful 
um, as the years go on. And more often than not, I'm sat here wondering, why the hell am I still here? You know, why can't I just Kurt Cobain it and just put an end to it all? And that might sound really quite dramatic and, and horrible, but sometimes that's really how I feel about the world. That's uh, so why I quite like working from home now is I just lock myself away and I just surround myself with animals. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose the argument could be then, if the world's such a hateful place, why do you write horror? Yeah, that'll be the next one. Yeah, I actually, um, there was a, there was someone who wanted, you know, they 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 were talking about the extreme horror and not liking the the majority of the community and a lot of the books are just by misogynistic men and things like that and i genuinely wanted to do a a podcast with that person because i thought it'd be really interesting to 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 hear why you know why do you feel that about the industry and what can we do to try and fix it um you know not me and that person but everyone how can we make it where everyone just gets on yeah. I don't think you can get on with everyone, though, can you, really? No, it, it goes back to what I said earlier. You can't please everyone. Yeah. And I, I, I'm just at the point of my life now where I just desperately wish we could. You know, I nearly died this year. Um, and I hear people cheering now. Oh, so close. <laughs> and it just made me realise that life is actually really, really short. And yet we spend so many days fighting with strangers online. Yeah, it's it's not worth it, is it? No. (laughs) No, but, you know, that's just the way it goes. I'm sure in 10 years it'll be something different entirely. Yeah, completely. So have you got any exciting projects that you're currently working on that you can share with us? Um, I'm actually in the middle of writing a book called Back in the Club, which is the sequel to Join Me in the Club. Um, where the government gives out tokens to lottery winners. If you get a white token, you have to go to the club and carry out the wishes of the person that got the red token. If you got the red token, you have the best night of your life, but by the end of the night, you have to be killed. And it's a way of controlling the ever-growing population numbers. Yeah. So I'm back to writing the the sequel to that, and I, I really enjoy it. But I've taken some time out to go back to writing children's books because I just I just enjoy it more. And I'd rather spend more time trying to make people smile than trying to fill the horror void up that that people seem to enjoy. Um, unfortunately, the children's book never really sell very well, um, just because uh, David Walliams seems to have cornered that market. Yeah. But it's just something I enjoy, so I'm just doing it for me. Um and I just finished making a film as well, uh, the, the Stillness in the Air. It was a 40-minute film, but I made the entire film completely by myself. Yeah, I uh, did see something about that on your uh, page that you'd uh, done. A couple, is it your second one? Your this, first is, one? this is the first one which I've done by myself. Um And it was hard, you know, because you set the tripod up with a mask on it so you can get the camera in focus. Then you put a lens cap on the floor where the tripod is and you move the tripod away. You go back to the camera, press record, go back to the lens cap, stand over that and do your acting. Then go and turn the camera off, check the footage. (laughs) I mean, it was a ball ache, but I've won two awards with it already, which I thought was great. Um, And now I want to write and uh, I want to make another two features by myself and then put them together in an anthology just called One. Yeah. And that's, I'm, I'm mainly doing it, A, because I was bored, and B, I wanted to inspire others, saying you don't need big crews and loads of money to make films. You can just go and do it by yourself. Because uh, that's all I've ever really wanted to do is just inspire other people. And that's easy with films, but with books, I just seem to be pissing people off. <laughs> So on to my next question. How would you give aspiring writers who want to break into the horror genre, what advice would you give them? I always start with the advice whenever I do the lessons, because I do one-to-one sessions that are tailored to what the person actually needs. Um, I always say, if you're doing this for the money, quit. Go and work at McDonald's or something like that, because 
you're not going to get any money doing this. Um, also, I'm not slurring McDonald's either. I used to work there and the free food was great. Um, but if you want to do it because you've got a passion to do it, then you just need to write. So just write for yourself. Don't beat yourself up if you struggle to write anything. Don't be afraid to delete and start again. But the most important thing is, is just finish the damn project. Because if what I've seen from a lot of people that want to write books is they'll get halfway through a book and then they'll convince themselves it's shit and they'll delete it and then they'll start again and they never actually finish it. Whereas the most important thing to do is finish it and then look at the project as a whole because you will make it better by rewriting it, but you'll also have some newfound confidence in the fact that you managed to finish it. Um, and on that note, I always say don't bother with a novel. Always start with a short story or a novella. The reason being you can sell it on Amazon for 99p, 99 cents. Just make a point in the blurb of saying it's a short story intended for people on Kindle Unlimited. <laughs> And you'll have more chance of selling it. A lot of new authors, they write their novels and then they release it at like $4.99 thinking they're going to sell loads. But realistically, with how many books that are out there, who's going to pay $4.99 for an author they've never heard of? Yeah. Not many. And that's pretty much it for that. Fantastic. Thank you. So where can the listeners find your work? Um, mostly on Amazon. If you want the the darker stuff that's not on Amazon, it's Big Cartel. Um, some of my work is also on Etsy. Um, but if you literally just put in my name with, you know, signed books, then it should, should pop up. Um, but yeah, if you've got Kindle Unlimited, I think like 90% of my work is available on Kindle Unlimited on Amazon. Um, we get paid fuck all, which is really annoying. But I'd rather the people were reading my books than not reading them. So if that's the way they read them, that's 100% fine by me. Yeah. What about your films? Uh, the films, they're on Amazon or Vimeo. Um, but if you just go to purgatorypictures.co.uk, that lists every film we've made and links directly to that, the publishing company and the film festival as well. Um, so it's kind of one house for everything um away from the Matt Shaw brand fantastic well it's been a pleasure having you on the show Matt yeah, so thanks thank for having you me. very much no thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time you're very welcome um 